どけなさが残る横顔微笑む笑顔俺に向けられているわけではないのになぜかこの胸が高鳴るふと見上げるお前の澄んだ人。俺は何も知らない少年のようにうつむいてしまういつになったらこの腕で抱けるのかいつになったら同じ朝を迎えられるのか叶わぬ夢と分かりつつもそんな温かい日を想像してしまう Disclaimer This poem was translated by my sister, a professional translator who would like to add that she is totally capable of translating poetry or lyrics into English while also making them rhyme and has done so in the past, but didn't choose to do so in this case for the purpose of reflecting the lack of poetic structure and overall lameness of the original text. Welcome to my 13th Breaking Up Dating Sims, a series where I analyze and review dating simulation games of old and somewhat new. If the title Albarea or Arubarea no Otome didn't touch your nostalgia spot, you probably haven't even heard of its existence. But believe it or not, the game was actually something of a sensation, at least if you were a gamer woman in East Asia during the 90s. I can't give you a clear cut answer on why this game was so quickly forgotten. One of the reasons, in my opinion, was due to its status as its second Otome game title, aka Dating Sims for Women, following the release of Angelique in 1994. While the Otome genre took another good 10 to 15 years to establish itself in the gaming market, Koei's Ruby Party held a firm grip on the small yet dedicated Otome market with seemingly endless supplies of merchandise. They soon followed up with a sequel, Angelique Special 2, on December 6, 1996, and April 1997 on the PC, FX, and Windows Saturn Play. PlayStation, respectively. Besides the intimidating Angelique series, the closest thing we got to an Otome game was Kekkon Marriage for the Sega Saturn, released on December 15, 1995. But Marriage was more of a dating simulation game where you can play as either gender, probably the first of its kind. Indeed, it was fun to create a 95 year old woman and date 25 year old men under the premise of marriage, but the game bombed partially due to failed marketing. However, it is a member of the Graduation series lineage, which has its own place in video game history, so I may cover it in a later video. Truly, the first competitor to ever challenge Ruby Party was Ritz Company Limited with Albarea no Otome on the June of 1997. Ritz was previously known for the Dragon Master Silk series, which were a typical wizardry style JRPG aimed towards male otakus, though the actual development was done by its subsidiary company, Gimmick House. Albarea no Otome was their second project as well as the second Otome title to be ever released in this world. The original PC FX version was released on June 27, 1997. The PlayStation port under a different publisher, Messiah of the Langrisser fame, was released October 8, 1998. A downloadable version was made available on PSN in May 15, 2009, switching publishers to Extreme Company Limited this time around. Even without playing the game, right off the bat, you can see Albarea no Otome took a lot of inspiration from Angelique. The game is set in a kingdom called Albarea in a world called Krashukes. Albarea is unique in a way that, apparently, the kingdom relies the entirety of its national defense on the power of the sacred maiden. Thus, whoever appointed for the position becomes the most powerful and also the most beloved individual in the kingdom. The tradition continued for 116 generations, protecting the realm against invasions from foreign lands. We're unclear on why Albarea remained in defense for hundreds of years despite having a massive strategic edge over their enemies, because we're not given any information regarding. The mechanics behind the power of the Sacred Maiden. Plus, as you'll soon find out, the game's no Mitsume tonight and is very light on the lore. Further overlap between Angelique and Elbarea no Otome includes. The story revolves around the system of a holy woman, Sacred Maiden in this game, who are supported by a number of men who are handsome and powerful. Here, there are the five holy knights. But again, being a pretty common trope, both games might have been influenced by other shoujo works, such as Hoshige Yugi. The current holy woman's powers are weakening, and the player character is one of the candidates under a trial for choosing the next sacred maiden. There are rival characters, not one, but two in this case. The player is a relatively average girl compared to her competitors. The player should choose between filling the role of the holy woman or romancing the handsome men. The game utilized animated cutscenes with a shoujo manga styled artwork as base. The game combines strategy with dating elements. Both games have a romantic compatibility stat with the romantic interests. Both games have annoying hidden stats. 
So at a glance, El Barreano Otome may seem like some Angelique clone attempting to cash in on the franchise, but a closer look reveals that sure, some elements do overlap, but any similarities are superficial at most. Before digging in any deeper, it's important to know that unlike Angelique, there is a big difference between the two ports of Alboreya no Otome. To avoid confusion, I'll focus on the PlayStation port considering it's probably the version most of us are familiar with, if we're familiar with it at all. And we'll follow up with the differences in the original PC FX version at a later section. The player character protagonist is given a fixed name, Ashanti Riss, nicknamed Ashan. You can still change her birthday and blood type which reflects on her initial stats and her romantic compatibility with the Holy Knights. You are to play through the in-game period of 14 months, following a weekly schedule. During the weekdays, Ashan can either take lessons to increase her stats, visit the Holy Knights office to talk to them, or rest. You have six stats, Stamina, Sword Fighting, Sorcery, Divine Magic, General Studies, and Etiquette. Every lesson costs Stamina. When Stamina hits below 30%, Ashanti may enter a down state and forced to rest for two days, missing out on lessons and events, including dates. On Saturdays, Ashan receives a private tutoring given by one of the Holy Knights of her choice, based on their speciality. One Saturday of every month is reserved for the Sacred Maiden evaluation where Ashanti and her rivals are tested on each subject. After the evaluation, Maria, the current Sacred Maiden, teaches the girls a special magic spell exclusive to Sacred Maidens to aid them in battle. And yes, combat is a big part of the game mechanic. Each Sacred Maiden spells have two levels and levels up once Ashan's stats meets a specific quota. On Sundays and holidays, you can navigate through the map of the Kingdom of Alborea between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., 8 hours in total. In the map screen, you can take up some free actions. That includes catching up on lagging stats by using the buildings corresponding to each subject. These self-study activities take 3 hours, available up to twice a day. Another option is visiting the Holy Knights to strike up a conversation, ask them out on a date, or to receive extracurricular lessons from them. Lessons are just as effective as self-study, but an increase in affection with the knight. Ashan can also visit her rivals, Fana and Muil, for a chat. Their affection stat grows in rapid pace, and being in friendly terms yields an increase in stats when taking lessons with them, so you got nothing to lose but an hour of in-game time by talking to them. Notice this game actually has a friendship ending, which is the first in the genre to do so. Maria too is always available in her room. Though she's mostly there for lore dump, this is the only place where you can check the quantified value of your stats. Otherwise, you'll have to reference this progress bar and make a vague assumption on where your stats are at, which is good enough in most cases, so you might as well sit and enjoy some ill-thought-out lore. There's a ton in this game, by the way. Such as why sacred maidens are not allowed to have lovers. The answer is, she loses her power when she falls in love with someone. On exactly how that's supposed to work, we can only guess. You can visit other locations on the map such as the park or stores and talk to characters that randomly happen to be in the place. All you get from that is a short conversation piece, but at least you can talk to extras that look like smushed potato sacks. And at some occasions, you can see the rivals having a date with the knights. And that's all there's to it. So you may conclude that these locations exist purely for world building and flavor, but this actually is a trap or more of an unintentional misdirection resulted from a poor game design. I'll come back to this later, so please stay tuned. Oh, and unlike Angelique and many other dating sims at the time, this game does have randomized weather conditions such as rain and snow and dialogue variations depending on the weather, so that's a nice touch. Several holidays are scattered throughout the year. Two of them are attached to romantic events. Apparently, Alba Rea wasn't very creative with its holidays, considering they celebrate Harvest Festival which is understandable because every agricultural civilization must have one of those, but Dissension Day, which is one of their biggest holidays, is just Valentine's Day with a different name, and they play out like what you expect. Either go out with your favorite night, or if you don't have anyone, spend the day like you would in any holiday. On every other month, Ashan, along with her rivals, Maria and the Holy Knights, and other important ministers of nobility are summoned to the palace to join a banquet with the king where a Holy Knight with the highest affection stat can accompany as her escort. After dinner, the king, Maria, and his ministers talk about the state of the kingdom, which is just extra lore dumping. I don't know if it's just me and my Mitsumita Knight mindset, but I was sure that one of the king's ministers was a traitor, but the game refused to delve any deeper, so that was just that. On the same month as the dinner banquet, Ashan is to gain field experience by accompanying one of the Holy Knights and battle monsters. Which brings us to our next topic.
Alba Rea no Otome follows a SRPG-style battle mode reminiscent of Final Fantasy Tactics or Summon Knight. You only get to control Ashanti, and the rest of the units, who are one of the five Holy Knights and his two subordinates, are set in auto battle mode, regardless of the AI, which works fine enough other than having trouble with pathfinding time to time. The tiny map and every fight coming down to witnessing the unlimited power of the Sacred Maiden candidate leaves the battles with absolutely no challenge whatsoever. Ashanti is equipped with an arsenal of buff spells she acquired during the aforementioned monthly evaluation test, ranging from healing, stat buffs, shields, and a haste spell that allows the fighters to double the actions per turn. On top of that, her MP recovers with every turn, so you technically got unlimited spells. The Sacred Maiden spells, once leveled up, targets all companions, so any battle is beatable by simply standing in a corner and spam buffs. If a mere candidate is this powerful, imagine how powerful the Sacred Maiden is. After the battle, the knights comment on her performance and their affection increases or decreases depending on the rating. Ashanti can learn an attack spell by being in battle with the same knight more than twice. The catch is, every one of them is pathetically weak. At first glance, the romance mechanic in Alborea looks fairly straightforward. The affection stats for the Holy Knights are increased with dates, office visits, right dialogue choices, random encounters in town, successful sacred maiden evaluations, and good battle results. The dates follow the generic dating sim dialogue choice format. The conversations change depending on affection and weather. A small amount of affection stat for every character is automatically deducted at the start of every week. Other obvious factors also negatively affect the affection stat, such as getting poor results in battles and sacred maiden tests and skipping out on dates. Another way to lose affection is to bump into a knight while being on a date with another knight. His reaction changes depending on his relationship with Ashanti. Higher affection results in greater loss. In conclusion, the typical stuff you'll expect from a normal dating sim, but don't let this game deceive you. Your path towards a romantic ending is surprisingly narrow. A blind playthrough aiming for a romantic ending will likely go like this. Date your favorite knight, see some affection triggered events, complete with two lame-ass poems per character. And since the dating system is similar to Tokimeki Memorial, you'd assume you just have to wait till the end to get a grand love confession. But a week before the endgame, the knight you're closest to gives you a farewell dialogue. You scratch your head. Surely his affection stat must be more than enough, so this must be a plot device to make the ending more dramatic? A week in-game time pass, and you end up with a bad ending with either of your rivals becoming the Sacred Maiden. The game ends abruptly with an illustration of your victorious rival. No ending credits, no return to menu. The only action you can take is turn off the game or reset, leaving you lost and confused. So what happened? Just like Campus Love Story and Mitsume Tonight, Albarea no Otome has a crucial event system where you're required to initiate a sequence of events to reach a romantic ending. Let's go back to the town map. I mentioned earlier that walking around town and visiting random locations in Alborea seem to carry no significance, and I told you it is a trap. See, on Sundays and holidays, Ashanti has to visit a specific place at a specific time frame at a specific weather condition in order to trigger a crucial event. How was I supposed to guess that when visiting a random location gives mundane dialogues 90% of the time? The manual gives a subtle clue in a line, keep visiting your knight's favorite places, but they seem to pop up everywhere with no particular preference. Even if you figure this out somehow, now you're tasked with, for the next approximately 10 months, reloading every Sundays, visiting 10 locations one by one to check if you're missing any crucial event. Oh, and you're only allowed to save on the evening of every Sunday. Yeah. So don't waste your valuable resources and look up a walkthrough. After completing the crucial events, you don't have to wait till the end of the 14th month. Ashanti either gets a love confession or depending on the Holy Knight, given a choice that could alter the course of their relationship. If Ashanti accepts the confession, the game ends immediately with a romantic ending. If she refuses, the game goes on as normal. However, this route, at least in the PlayStation port, is a guaranteed bad ending, almost as if punishing the player, all because of a hidden stat called trust. I said in my Angelic review that since the gameplay is long and repetitive, the best strategy is to 9 time all the guardians to max out their affection and save before the endings. Well, sadly, that won't work in Elbarea no Otome. It's impossible to set up the game for multiple romantic endings in one playthrough thanks to the aforementioned trust stat. 
A condition for a romantic ending is the knights having a high affection and trust stat with Ashanti. Makes sense, but the thing is, the romantic ending flag of a knight with 100 trust becomes deactivated after another knight has, say, 80. I've only figured out after reading the walkthrough that the difference in the trust stat between the romancing knight and the other four knights need to be greater than 70 in order to achieve a romantic ending. The Sacred Maiden ending is actually harder than the romantic endings, since it requires balancing the trust between all the knights. That's why it's not possible to achieve a Sacred Maiden ending after refusing a knight's romantic confession, since that would mean that the margin in the trust stat between the holy knights are way too big. Because while the trust stat increases simultaneously with the affection stat, it drastically increases once you see a romantic event with a knight. But I found out the PCFX port gives you a Sacred Maiden ending regardless after dumping the knight, so the bar might be lower. Therefore, the best strategy for a Sacred Maiden ending is dating no one and building trust with all the knights via taking private lessons and accompanying battles with them in rotation. I personally found this ending most satisfying, perhaps because unlike Angelique's queen ending, Ashanti must actually dedicate herself in becoming a Sacred Maiden. Also, the hidden character and friendship story route is unlocked only after this ending. Contrast to the game mechanic that discourages you against two-timing your dates, Alborea no Otome for some reason made the choice to not have one, but three fortune tellers. One tells your affection and compatibility with the knights and rivals. Assuming you're aiming for the Sacred Maiden ending, it could serve as a tracker. Another one randomly increases decreases compatibility with the knight of your choice with a raffle. Utterly useless. You can only romance one knight per playthrough anyways, and the game is balanced in a way that repetitive dates guarantees him falling for you no matter how low the compatibility is. And the third fortune teller lets you know the precise location of a knight, which sounds useful in a case where you're not looking up a walkthrough, but since you can't specify on which knight you want to locate, it's ultimately half-assed. And let's not forget this is an excruciatingly slow-paced game. Albarea no Otome has loading between everything, and transitioning from one screen to another is sluggish while the delay between the dialogues and the standing sprites takes way too long. Closing down one window and opening another takes yet another loading. You can't fly through the red dialogues, because the only way to move on to the next dialogue is the circle button, and mashing on it out of frustration will end up selecting the wrong dialogue choice. So failing to achieve your desired ending really takes a mental toll on you. I repeat, just look up a walkthrough. At least, the original PC FX version has a much faster pace without a noticeable loading time. But my compliment stops there because other factors makes the game almost as slow as the PlayStation port. The most obvious difference between the versions are the in-game graphics. The pixel-based graphics for the PC FX Albarea no Otome were completely overhauled in the PlayStation version to have an illustrative look, and the developers changed the standing sprites to resemble the animated cutscenes rather than keeping the original character design. And the players of the PlayStation ports did notice the huge gap in artistic style between the standing sprites and the event CGs. The standing sprites for the PlayStation was based on the designs of Nishi Okashinobu, who was also in charge of the animation team. At that time, he was most known for his role as an art director for anime such as Vampire Princess Miyu, the TV series, and Magic Knight Ray Earth, and doing character designs for Devil Man Lady. And this is the illustration used in the event CGs. We're talking about the same game here. The person behind the illustration and the character design is shoujo manga artist Motegi Harue. Not trying to sound rude, but in my opinion, she wasn't a good fit for the game's overall atmosphere. I think Motegi Harue's art style may be good for, say, Ribbon, a shoujo manga magazine for preteen girls. And from what we can see from her works, she's indeed more specialized in that genre. Motegi even mentioned in her personal website that Nishioka did the armor designs for the Holy Knights, presumably because she was inexperienced in drawing armor. Though considering back in the mid-90s, having animated cutscenes in video games were considered a luxury, and the animated designs looking different from the game was, for lack of a better word, passable. Animations in Alborea no Otome were exclusive only for the opening and endings. And keeping in mind it was the mid-90s, using Motegi's designs for the standing sprites and the event CGs, but having animated endings wasn't particularly newsworthy. However, in the PlayStation port, Rich choice to overhaul the standing sprites to Nishioka's design, yet keeping Motegi's event CGs draws significant attention to the inconsistencies. And I don't think it was a budget problem, since the new standing sprites have a lot more variations compared to the 
the previous version, and they additionally hired Motegi for new illustrations for the PlayStation port. Motegi also worked on the package art for the PlayStation version, which resembles nothing of the actual in-game graphics. On the opposite, the PCFX package art used Nishioka's designs. It's a weird marketing choice through and through. Another difference between the two ports that stands out the most is the battle mode. As you can see, the maps in the PCFX version are unnecessarily huge, and the player is given the choice to manually control the Holy Knight and his two subordinates alongside Ashanti. While the player characters are armed with a barrage of spells, none of them is a movement buff, and the spells in the PCFX, while huge in quantity, lacks in variety, most of them being AoE attacks and healing spells categorized under different damage levels, similar to La, Ga, and Ja from the Final Fantasy series. So the battle involves crawling through the map, chasing down enemies all the while spamming attack and healing spells. The Holy Knights are extremely overpowered, and it's tempting to sweep the floor with them, but what makes the battle tedious is it's not the strength of the enemies, but the victory conditions for the best result, where Ashan is required to finish up X amount of enemies to achieve a higher rank. Uh, I mean rank. The better the rank, the more stats she gains. All of this was omitted in the PlayStation version. The problem is that Ashanti is incredibly weak and doesn't become useful until the later part of the game. So basically, every battle involves strategically placing the Holy Knight and his subordinates to soften up the enemies using AoE attacks until Ashanti can deliver a killing blow with her attack spells. This is easier said than done since everyone has a finite number of MP which does not recover per turn, unlike the PlayStation version. Oh, and the enemy's HP remains hidden during the player's turn. You can only estimate based on the glimpse of visibility when they are making a move, so make sure to keep your eye glued to the screen. With bigger maps, completing a battle can take up to half an hour depending on your luck. Some actually prefer the battle in PCFX for being more strategic, but I call it tedious and redundant. They even got the old reinforcements upon defeating the map boss thing going on, just like Super Robot Wars. Thankfully, once Ashanti meets her quota, you can switch to auto battle to leave the rest up to the NPCs. Also, only in the PCFX version you get an opportunity to fight alongside your rivals. And unlike Super Robot Wars, it's a relief they're controlled automatically. With the two bigger things out of the way, here's a list of the smaller changes. Upon their initial meeting, Ashan and her rivals had a weird way of introducing themselves by name, birthday, zodiac sign, and blood type. The PlayStation version changed that to just saying their names, so it wasn't Elberia culture like I assumed. You cannot choose which Holy Knight to accompany in battle or take private lessons from. Stats are numeric by default. The standing sprites for the extras honestly look better than their PlayStation counterparts. You learn spells by reaching a certain stat without the help from Maria. On Sundays and holidays, you must move Ashanti manually like in a typical RPG map instead of pointing and picking a location and being done with. The PlayStation port has female knights. In the PCFX battle, one of the subordinate knights with a feminine name, Alicia, had a voice of an old man. Alicia appears in person in the PlayStation version and is a woman, but this time we don't have a voice so perhaps Alicia always has been a feminine looking person with the voice of an old man. I shouldn't be too quick to judge. And the guardsmen in Ashanti's dormitory are women, which makes sense. PCFX version has no dialogue choices during dates. Ashanti has an option to ask for a date, talk to the knights when she bumps into them in town. The knights can also ask her out. Only in the PCFX port, the knights knock on your door to ask you out, like the guardians in Angelique. Affection decreases very easily compared to the PlayStation version. The other knights are so jealous they lose affection whenever Ashanti goes out with another knight. I assume the knight who had a date brags about it. So as the game progresses, with the exception of the knight with the highest affection, other holy knights become assholes to Ashanti, intentionally ignoring her and telling her she shouldn't be there, wherever she is. The PlayStation version has additional romantic and non-romantic events. The dinner banquet and an event where Ashanti gets saved by her favorite knight from an enemy country's assassin are exclusive to PlayStation. There are also PlayStation exclusive events occurring after weekday lessons where Ashanti gets a random conversation between the holy knights or their subordinates. The PCFX version of Elba Reana Otome has no bonus menu which usually contains events, CGs, and endings. The PlayStation 4 does have one, but in the most absurd and hilarious way. You won't find an album mode where you can rewatch important events, including the ending. It doesn't even have a gallery mode where it displays your collection of CG illustrations. The bonus menu in Elba Reana Otome has one single content. Playing the ending song for Elba Reana Otome. 
sung by T.A.P. Takarazuka Angel Project on a black screen with the title and the group's name on it. That's it. That's a bonus menu. Adding to the hilarity, the game manual dedicated five whole pages on this group. But overall, I still recommend the PlayStation port despite its slow pace since the battles are much easier. And I prefer this version of the Holy Knight standing sprites. They at least got broader shoulders. Ashanti Riss Ashanti, who's the player character in El Barea no Otome, at first seems like a typical Otome protagonist. But unlike the blushing maiden protagonists we get to see a lot in Otome games, she's very forward when it comes to romance. Despite what I said about the sacred maiden ending being more satisfying, judging from her stealing glances at the knights in the opening movie, she really doesn't seem that interested in becoming one. Fana de la Wilbel Lion Dyke and Muriel Melroaz. These two girls are Ashanti's rivals competing for the position of Sacred Maiden. Although coming from a similar background, Fauna isn't as self-assured and arrogant as Rosalia, the rival character in Angelique. Muriel is from a prominent academic family whom possesses the ultimate artifact which can restore the weakening power of the Sacred Maiden and letting it rot in their storage. In the friendship ending, Muriel does manage to find and submit the item, hence prolonging Maria's run as the Sacred Maiden and breaking the entire premise of the game. But that should help Ashanti, Fana, and Muriel remain BFFs for a prolonged time. Maria Josefa Fan Nasso as a current sacred maiden, her power is already weakening at the young age of 28. She serves as a mentor to Ashanti and her rivals, who might in turn teach their successors in a decade if a typical career span of a sacred maiden is really that short. But considering the fashion choice of what I presume to be the official sacred maiden attire, even 10 years seems too long. And before moving on to the romanceable characters, it's worth noting that Albarea was the first Otome game to have dedicated story roots per character, similar to many visual novels. Granted, they're all not that great, and reeks of questionable ethics with zero self-awareness in the guise of romance, which is, to be fair, pretty common in lots of romance genres, even to this day. I personally found none of the Holy Knights appealing as a character, not because they follow a trope when that's somewhat expected for the genre, but because their story fails to deliver the satisfaction of building a relationship with them. As an extreme example, a synthetic character, whether you like them or not, is designed to give the sense of gratification among opening up to the protagonist, especially if you're the one controlling the player character, and was partially the reason behind the popularity of Shiori from the original Tokimeki Memorial, despite her personality being more like a snobbish vanilla rather than a chindere. Or think of the radiant smile the usually stern Lord Julius finally gives you after all that hard work of safe scumming. That's effort paying off right there. But none of the Holy Knights are like that. They remain one-dimensional and boring throughout. Disclaimer, since this section includes hidden romanceable characters, spoilers are ahead. Leon Durandal Leon, leader of the Knights of Crimson Flame, is the generic hot-headed and uptight leader guy. Living with his mother and younger sister, he's a rather conservative man whose ideal woman is a domestic goddess. He's the type of person telling Ashanti on a date that she shouldn't frequent the weapons shop because it will damage her reputation as a marriageable woman. Besides that, for a character who's featured as the main romantic interest and ending up with Ashanti in the manga version, he's very bland. Kind Goatsland He's the leader of the Knights of Blue Torrent, who's in contrast to Leon, quiet and cool-headed. In the PlayStation port, Kain is the only knight who does not ask the player out on a date. You always have to ask him out first. Judging from his ending, I don't think it's due to his shyness alone because the guy is a mere sociopath. Besides specializing in magic, Kain likes to conduct magical experiments. He drags Ashanti into one of his most dangerous field tests, resulting in the loss of her voice. The only reason she survived is because Maria felt something was off and cast a barrier spell in the entire premise. Kain reacts by quitting his knighthood on the spot and taking Ashanti with him in a search for a cure. And he prefers it this way since he can now keep her all to himself. And Maria's like, okay, cool, because that was supposed to be romantic. Jean Henri de Sao. Jean is a talented warrior who became the leader of the Knights of Roaring Thunder at the age of 13. A generic cheerful Shota, he's taking in a huge responsibility at such a young age and never having a chance to experience romance. He isn't sure how to react to a girl he loves. Of all the romantic roots and endings, I think he got the most tolerable one. He's also the only knight who doesn't require the visiting random locations for a romantic ending thing. This makes Jean the goodest of all boys. Makato R. Shaibani 
He is the kind-hearted leader of the Knights of Deep Green, who hails from a foreign nation in the Western Hills, where he was born as a prince of a small tribe. Not wanting his love for Shanti to get in his way of her becoming the Sacred Maiden, he comes up with the most bizarre solution possible. As in he asks Muil to act as his lover so that he could avoid his arranged marriage, so that Ashant doesn't have to go through the trouble of accompanying him to his hometown? Good thing Miel wasn't blind enough to go through with that. Not only the plan is stupid, it involves hurting his loved one while throwing a third person under the bus. So he's basically one of those kind-hearted characters, whose kindness is a mere character profile and tropey mannerisms. Rotel or Rotor El Nerf Ling Tempo Volt I thought his English spelling would be something like Lothair, since it's not particular and it sounds aristocratic, and he is from a noble lineage, and because it's an existing name that sounds similar to the Japanese writing of his name, but it was Rotor, not even Router, according to the official website. Sounds like Motor. The official spelling also uses Elba R-I-A for no good reason instead of Elba R-E-A which sounds closer to the original Japanese pronunciation, but who am I to judge? Broder is the signature playboy of the game and the leader of the Knights of Radiant Light. Although unlike Lord Oscar from Angelique, he's so insecure in his womanizing skills that he has to forcibly kiss Ashan to stop a little girl from chasing him around. With all his senior mentors like this, I really fear for John's future. And like every fictional misogynistic womanizer pretty boy, he suffered from abandonment by his mother as a child. Ren Muabia This hidden romanceable character is a mysterious man who Ashan found so handsome that she decided to stalk him to his secret relaxing place. He's in truth the captain of the guard in Elberea Palace and the Holy Knight of Black Jade. No explanation is given on why the captain of the guard must stay in the shadows like some kind of spy master. Words do change its meaning according to historical circumstances, but this game never goes that deep into the lore. I honestly thought Ren was to revolt against the king because in the final battle in the PCFX version, there is an enemy NPC that looks just like him. Maria also talks about the existence of a fallen sacred maiden, and an enemy unit that looks like a dark palace swap version of Maria appears along with the Ren looking NPC, but even that was reading too much into nothing. It's shown in the ending as if Ashan fell under his dark spell to be his eternal servant, and I'm not sure on whether or not that was consensual. King William IV He's the ruling king of Alborea and technically a hidden romanceable character. His ending is achieved by visiting him every holiday and Sundays where he usually talks about some lore about Alborea. But at every 10th visit, he creepily tells Ashan of how she reminds him of his dead wife. After 44 visits, with the royal announcement that Ashan will become the queen consort, you get a comedic ending illustration. With how old he looks, becoming a queen regent would have been much more satisfying. Between 1992 and 2002, Rich released only a handful of games, and in terms of multimedia marketing, Elberea no Otome seemed to be their most ambitious project. The PlayStation port came out with a tie-in manga and novel between 1998 and 1999. In fact, the manga was serialized in the same magazine as Angelique, but the efforts were not enough to topple or even compete against the Otome game giant that was Ruby Party. Instead of attempting to grow the niche with further investment, Ritz seemed to quickly drop Elbarea no Otome, making it fade into obscurity, with the only cultural relevance remaining in the memory of the early fans of Otome games. The most active fandom I discovered survived to the early 2000s, and one of their center of operation was the original character designer, Mutegi Harue's personal website. Mutegi was very passionate about Alborea, and a big part of her website was dedicated to posting behind-the-scenes details about the development and the lore-only backstories for the characters. Furthermore, she ran reoccurring character popularity polls and answered game-related questions on her forum. Motegi's moved on since, but she's still active on Twitter for those who are wondering. After Alborea no Otome, Rich has made an interesting move since its release of Dragon Master Silk 1 and 2 on May 2002, and did a 180 turn from making male otaku-related content and released a Princess Maker-style BL game named Perfect Prince on the December of the same year. And that was the last we've heard of them. Surprisingly, the website for Gimmick House is still online, with the last update being in January 2004. 
It was interesting to see a title carrying so much significance in otome game history can be so quickly forgotten if not given proper attention. I mean, my sister and I bought the game back in the day after reading somewhere that it was an Angelique Isk game. All I have are vague memories of my sister complaining on how boring it is. The sentiment rings true after properly playing through the whole game. Alboreano no Otome forces multiple playthroughs despite having no replay value, and you end up repeating the same process over and over again, only with different romantic interests. Interests, so by the second time, you would already feel like you're operating the world's most labor-intensive slideshow. I would recommend it to folks who want to cross the play the second otome title off their gaming list. And do play it with a walkthrough in case you're going for romantic endings. To end things on a positive note, the music in Elborea no Otome, credits to Sora Mimi Studio, was good enough for me to stop and think, that's good. I especially like the piano and orchestral pieces. I give my thanks to Inazawa Yasuhiro or Kisaragi Yuki, the composer for Sora Mimi Studio, who's behind masterpieces such as Death Crimson Ox, who's since retired and is currently running a computer repair business. And that about does it. Thanks for watching while I finally went back to complaining about dating sims after months of detour. Hope you found this fun and or useful in some way. Be seeing you in the next video.